One of the biggest issues for parents of teens is figuring out what's normal teenage behaviour and when their child might need some extra support. Today, I talked to parenting expert and influencer Helen Wills about how parents can support teenagers through the many different challenges that they face during adolescence, whilst often trying to manage menopausal symptoms. Hi, I'm neuroscientist Dr Ben Webb, and I want to help you cultivate a healthy brain for a mentally healthy and happy life. Welcome to episode 58 of Better Brain, Better You. Hello there. Hope you've had a great week and really pleased you could join me for today's episode on midlife parenting of teenagers with parenting influencer Helen Wills. Before we get started, I want to give you a free workshop on how to parent a teenage brain. On this workshop, we share the four essential strategies for parenting teenagers to help you resolve common teenage problems, connect with your teenager, influence teenage behaviour and support a teenager's mental health. If you tried to connect with your teenager but found it difficult to resolve their problems and worries that they struggle with every day, whether it's emotional outbursts, too much screen time, disrupted sleep, risky behaviour or even mental health challenges, then this workshop will really be helpful for you. You can watch the free workshop at ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash workshop. That's ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash workshop. Okay, so let's dive into a really interesting conversation with parenting expert Helen Wills. Welcome to the podcast, Helen. Hi, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us today. So you began your writing career and started as a freelance writer, I think I'm correct in saying, writing for other brands, and you started your blog in 2011. So what made you decide to start blogging about lifestyle and parenting? Um, <laughs> boredom, really. <laughs> um, I'd had quite a big corporate career before I had my kids. Um, and when I had my daughter I found it just a massive shock I was I was such a workaholic that I became a bit of a perfectionist with her um and I couldn't I I've I'd fully intended to go back to what I've been doing previously but I, I just couldn't do it um so I um had another baby <laughs> raised them both and then just realized that I was stagnating I was busy all of the time every parent will say how busy they are with a with a young child but and exhausted but my brain just was stagnating um I'm not great with little kids it's not my forte that was my husband um but I I, I at the time the internet was beginning to be the place to go for advice and my daughter had reflux and my husband found me a forum on mum's net on dealing with reflux in a baby and I started to just so I, th I don't even think we had google back then this is how old I am now Ben <laughs> um, I started to just google things and over time I found a couple of parenting blogs the first one I found was a dad blog um rather and you know that was quite rare back then so interesting that i stumbled across him first and i thought he writes so beautifully about what it's like raising a child he was on his own sadly i could do that i'd already been writing um a handwritten diary for my daughter and i was writing it in her voice bizarrely i put it down to it being a journal that i was gifted on my birthday after i'd had a glass or two of champagne i was writing it in her voice i don't know where that came from but people who read it decided it was funny engaged with it loved it and so i thought you know what i'm going to put that online and see what happens and i never had any expectations of it other than that it would keep my mum up to date and uh, maybe some of my friends would give me a little bit of an ego boost telling me that I was quite funny and that was it but it just took off from there wow it's amazing and now it's a huge so you're a big influence out there aren't, aren't you in the in the parenting space so can that be how do you find that so how do you so it must be challenging at times you know to, in that role and do you, how do you managing the expectations and is there always pressure to produce up-to-date content? 
Oh, well, there is, but it's pressure of my own making. Nobody else really cares. You say a big influencer. I, You know, I'm not a million followers on Instagram kind of influencer. Um, my blog is is pretty well read um, and um, and it is my main source of income. So, yes, it's a really good, solid platform. Um, but no one cares if I don't put something out there every day except me. And so that's actually something that I've had to really work on myself with recently. Um, I did buy into the the message, and it's a true message, that you have to be creating regular, consistent content on a platform that has its own algorithm to get anywhere, to grow. Um, and I, I nearly killed myself over it. I, that, that's an exaggeration. But I, I, I would sit in bed every night having worked hard all day, not had the energy or imagination to come up with something new and creative that I think my readers will love and think, what am I going to put on Instagram tomorrow morning? And it was losing me sleep and it was causing me anxiety. And so actually I just stopped and, and, and I now post two or three times a week, a bit more if I think something's happened that people might be interested in. But the important thing to me is that what I put out there is of value to someone. And if it's just me spouting something for the sake of the algorithm, it's not worth it. It's not of value to anybody. Yeah, so you're starting to, to manage your well-being a bit better in that way. Yeah, and hopefully provide proper value for the people that bother to follow me thankfully who are lovely and always you know I, and I know when I've got it right because they will engage with me and it'll be a me too moment and you so you also I think I'm correct to saying so you co-edit the family travel site space in your case yes that's that's right and you say so you offer inspiration and tips for parents passionate about travel so that must be is that challenging at the moment given the kind of current situation and and what what if what are your sort of top travel tips for 2022? Oh my goodness. Um, yes, it's been challenging to answer the first question because there's just not been content to put out there. I know some people who are purely travel bloggers, don't blog about anything else, who've really struggled through the pandemic, but they have managed to keep coming up with advice to, around travel with COVID as things have, have moved forward. That's not what our site is about. Um, it is purely inspiration for places you can go to with kids who you that you may not have thought of um cost effective places to take kids ways to do long haul with kids um and 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 basically trips and holidays that the four of us have done over the years with our various aged children i mean tips going forward i'm not really sure i'm in a position to advise anybody because we have a holiday booked a big one in at easter and I still don't even know if it's going to happen because I've got a 14 year old who currently cannot be vaccinated and where we're going wants double vaccinations. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think we're all we're all in the same boat at the moment, kind of sometimes going somewhere, sometimes going nowhere, sometimes bobbing around, not able to decide where we're going. <laughs> so you, you, you mentioned your daughter there. So I, if I understand correctly as well. So you, your daughter was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And you amazingly, so you lobbied Parliament for some more research on that particular disease for which, again, if I understand correctly, there's no cure. So how, so how was that experience and how, I mean, I mean, most importantly, how was your daughter managing with her diabetes and how are you managing, you know, as a parent of, of, a, of a young lady with, with diabetes? Yeah, it's not easy. And, um, this time of year, there's always an influx of people into the support groups that I belong to of very anxious parents sending their children back to school after a diagnosis. And it, I get, I've got goosebumps now just talking about it, but it, it's heartbreaking for them. And because I remember how devastating it was at the time, I mean, diabetes is a life threatening condition and it, it depends on minute doses of insulin that change every day with every meal. Um, and you still, even though you do that assiduously, you still don't get it right. You can do exactly the same thing two days running and get two wildly different sets of blood glucose responses. So it's, it's a lot more exhausting than people imagine it to be. So that was a massive learning curve. Um, 
she is doing really well and for anybody that happens to be listening that happens to have this diagnosis and is quite recent to it it is awful to begin with and it is hard for life but we're seven years in now and she does everything that she would want to do she wouldn't have it any other way and whilst it causes me uh, extra anxiety and stress we just work hard to make sure that she can do everything so she's just got an extremely good set of results at GCSE she's my eldest she's 16 she's just been to Reading Festival alone with her mates um yes I didn't sleep an awful lot while she was away but she did it and was fine um so <sighs> Anyone who's managing a condition like diabetes, and it's not just diabetes, there's lots of kids I've realised since who have complex things that they need to deal with at school every day, who, and we don't know what they're dealing with. We have no idea until we're involved in it ourselves. You know, they deserve huge credit, but you can do it. Everyone can do it. And most of us do do it really well. I was just wondering, I mean, to what extent can you manage type one in particular with sort of exercise and diet changes or is it only largely controllable through as you say through these kind of micro doses of insulin yeah it's got to be insulin you won't survive without insulin if you have a type one diagnosis because the pancreas basically just stops producing insulin whereas with type two in some cases it will produce insulin, although maybe not as much, or it will produce insulin, and your but your body is resistant to it. Um, with type one, it produces no insulin at all, and without insulin, you will die. Um, so you have to inject insulin, um, and you inject an amount to cover the carbohydrate in your food. So every time you eat a carbohydrate, that will turn to glucose eventually, and so you have to take insulin beforehand to match that carb dose and the hospital will agree with you how much how much carbohydrate you eat per one unit of insulin that's how it works um and but that changes depending on because insulin's a hormone and i hadn't realized that and we have way more hormones than we know and so every time our other hormones do something in the body insulin responds to that so stress, adrenaline, cortisol, those hormones will usually raise blood sugar and insulin ought to take care of that. But of course, we don't know that until we see a really high blood sugar. The after effects of cortisol and adrenaline can also cause a massive drop in blood sugar after you've gone to sleep as the body starts to settle itself back down. And so you can have a massive low blood sugar, which is incredibly dangerous while you're asleep. Um, and it's not just those, you know, um, girls' hormones, uh, growth hormone, we've just come out the other side of that, but growth hormones from sort of 11 to 15 was horrific. It caused us so many sleepless nights. And that's what people don't realise. I didn't realise, had no idea. I thought you just don't eat sweets. You take the insulin they tell you to take, you eat what they tell you to eat and it works. And it, it really isn't like that. Wow. So it's a kind of, it's a, day, a daily management process or week by week management process. Yeah. 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 I mean, occasionally you get a week where you don't have to change very much. You just have to take, take the insulin that your meter tells you to take, um, and do things the right way. But, um, yeah, most days something needs dealing with that you weren't expecting. Oh, but she's not gradually transitioning to sort of managing it as best she can herself. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot to take on and it's harder probably when it's not your body. Um, so she, as she gets older, pays a bit more attention to how her body feels. Before, or, or, you know, she, she's able to take a bit more on as she, as her maturity develops. So you started, uh, so you've been, you've been blogging since 2011, as I said, uh, uh, parenting, about parenting and lifestyle, particularly parenting teens and and lifestyle issues as well and you started your teenage kicks podcast last year last year which has a sort of a teenage mental health as its focus and talking to real people about their challenges and trying to empower teen teenagers to actually tackle their own problems so it really sounds like you you know you're unpacking and 
tackling tackling some sort of real the real problems that teenagers and parents are facing every day so what's what's the sort of format of the podcast and what's your goal goal with the podcast yeah so it's a guest format like this where i speak to one or two other people about something that happened to them in their teenage years i mostly talk to adults um because it's it's nice to be able to talk to somebody who's been through something very difficult as a young person but who has become an adult and come to a place of understanding what that was about and helping themselves to recover from it or cope with it on an ongoing basis um i didn't want to speak to experts because experts haven't all always been in the place that young people are they don't have the same parents might see them as as credible but i don't think they have the same credibility with teenagers um and they and you know if teenagers seek help it will be experts that they speak to i wanted them to speak to somebody who or hear from somebody who has been through what they're going through who can say i felt this i did this this happened to me and for them to be able to say yeah that's exactly how i feel mom that's how i feel or even just on their own this is how i feel this person gets me um and the reason for doing it in the first place was that the world is full of online advice it's now full of parenting bloggers it's a wonderful wonderful resource any parent who has an issue with a toddler can easily go and search that on the internet and find somebody else hundreds of other people who've had exactly the same and read from that and take a reassurance and b potentially advice on what they decide they want to do going forward to improve the situation when kids reach 10 11 12 all of that information dries up because nobody wants to share the problems of their children which which at that age are starting to get less trivial less amusing less head lice and poo issues and more mental health issues personal issues even you know girls periods nobody really wants to talk about that partly because it feels too personal and it's their story to tell not ours as their parents and partly because they and their friends are now finding this content and are able to read it i have lots of my children's friends who follow me on instagram so i'm very careful what i put on there but that that means that there's a whole bunch of parents of tweens and teens who are sitting there full of anxiety thinking what would other people do who can i ask to find out what people have done to resolve this or even just to offload and find a kindred spirit and it's and that and it's not there and i didn't want to be the person that put that out either because it's my kids so it needed to be something it that's why it needed to be adults it needed to be people who've been through it themselves rather than my personal story my kids personal story so i'm really just facilitating people to talk through their teenage difficulties how they felt and what they've done about it for inspiration so it's adults that have been, adults that have been through teenage difficulties and talking to an audience of largely teenagers listening to those and, and reflecting on those issues yeah yes and and things that are quite tough as well that most teenagers probably don't want to own up to most parents don't want to tell their friends are happening but the statistics say that a lot of teenagers are suffering with this or, or are, are experiencing it. So I've talked to a man about bulimia in his teenage years. I've talked to a really wonderful woman who self-harmed for a long time as a teenager. Um, I've spoken to people who've been sexually assaulted, some really tough things. And then some quite some less harrowing, but still nonetheless very tough things. So living with a difficult condition, haven't interviewed my daughter or told my story, but I have spoken to a type one diabetic who really struggled with his diabetes and has consequences of that in later life. Now, um, I've talked to people about bullying, um, social media bullying, 
uh, failing exams and still going on to do great things. You know, all the, the I was someone who was expelled. My very first episode was someone who was expelled because school just didn't suit her. <laughs> Um, who's who's now got a great life. I love that. So it's really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really showing them the experience that they had during the teenage years and, you know, the full range of those and how good or bad that might actually be. And then coming through the other side and seeing how they've ended up, what they've done with their life and, you know, how they've moved on or not moved on or are still living with that particular issue. Yeah. And for, and for people to see that, just because they're going through something right now that they think is the end of their world, it really isn't, and it doesn't have to be. There are things that you you either can do something about it now, or you can you can trust that you will get past this, and something else will happen that is good. Yeah, it's much more believable, I guess, much more tangible when you're actually hearing it, as you say, from someone who's experienced it. Yeah, I mean, the lady who who, who self harmed. Just sorry to interrupt, but this is just a, a perfect example. The lady who who self harmed for such a long time, and told the story with such warmth, was deputy editor of Cosmopolitan magazine. So, you know, it it none of these things need to define young people. No, absolutely. You know, so one of the biggest issues for parents of teens is trying to figure out, I think, and teens themselves, you know, what what's kind of normal, if you like, typical, if in inverted commas, whatever that means, typical teenage behaviour, and what their child might need extra support with. I think that's one of the certainly with the work we do, one of the biggest, a big challenge for lots of parents to try and understand. But you're so right. It's it's really difficult for parents, and and I, I'm actually now a coach, and I coach parents, not not teenagers because i found it incredibly difficult to know when to step in and and say right i can see that you need help with this let's i'm going to force the issue you are going to talk to me about it and when to take a deep breath and leave it a few days and know that or even a few weeks or even a few months and know that this is just my teenager going through difficult emotions in order to figure out who she or he is um, and what they want to do about it. And, and, and that's crucial. I do think stepping in too soon, trying to resolve their problems for them, takes away that learning curve. And it's such a crucial learning curve, but it's so painful as parents to sit and watch it happen. <laughs> um, so yeah, that you're you you hit the nail on the head with that. That is exactly the biggest problem for a parent is the confidence to allow your child to grow away from you and be their own person. In terms of the biggest issues, I mean, I can't deny it, although I do hate the the fear mongering around it. Social media is tough. Um, I do. I do counsel people when I, whenever I can not to be too terrified of social media and not to p panic about things that their kids are potentially hearing, seeing, doing, saying. Um, because ultimately social media is that is part of their life. There's no such thing as in real life and online life for them, for us as, as well, for me as a 50 something person, it's, it is a it is more alien it is a separate th issue it's hard for us to see it the way they see it because we didn't grow up with it but they've grown up with it and so they have to learn to navigate it and so i, I get quite antsy when people try to ban their kids from apps from the internet from live gaming devices because my take on that is that if they are wanting to be there it's because all of their friends are there and if all of their friends are there then everything they want to see and talk about they're going to find a way to see and talk about it because their friends will show them so i want to be the person who spoke to them about it first so if my child's coming home and saying i, I mean we've got this one at the moment actually do you know the program sex education um on netflix it's an 18 for a very good reason but both my kids will watch it. My 16-year-old's watched it all. There's a new se season coming up. My 14-year-old, we've had a discussion together as a family with my eldest to say, is he ready for that? And we think he is. So he will watch it. And we think he is because we know 
from language that we've heard around his friends and from things that other parents have said, that the things that are covered in that programme are being discussed amongst his friends. And I want him to know about those in a safe way first, rather than knowing about them via, well, I, I like to say playground gossip and, and hysteria. It's not playground, it's, you know, they're in secondary school, but the hysteria, and it is hysteria that they all work themselves up with. Um, and I, you know, I want, I want a balanced view. So for, for me, and it depends on the child, and each child has a different age for it, they need to be online if they want to be online. They need to be watching stuff if they want to be watching it. They just need to do it with, with their parent advising them on what it means. Yes, it's wise to be concerned about it, aware of it, but not to worry about it. You will know, I think, when some, if, if you're immersed in it and you're with them and you talk to them about it openly, you will know when something is happening that needs more of your attention that isn't good. And, and that's when you need to take action. Not, you can't prevent them. You can only help support them through it. I mean, absolutely. I think perhaps, you know, most importantly in lots of ways is for, for all of those things that you're talking about is you want to remain and stay connected with your children so that you can talk to them and education and providing them with the kind of right information, as you said, you know, is so important around those things. That doesn't necessarily mean, for instance, with social media, banning it, but it might mean giving you the education and kind of tools and strategies for you know having a healthy relationship with it and using it in a kind of in, you know in a health in a healthy way and similar similarly with you know with the sex education and many other things like that you know as you say it's so important for them to have the right information and for you to kind of to normalize it you know to discuss it and you know and and, and have those conversations yeah totally and i think i think the place where social media is something that parents really do need to be very aware of and mindful of um is the pressure that kids some kids feel to a be there all the time and respond to every notification in the moment and b um i do feel that there is there is there is a problem around self image and self esteem still by what they see on on social media there is stuff that amounts to stop to soft porn on Instagram that is legal according to Instagram. I've reported it and reported it and reported it and apparently it breaks no regulations. But girls in particular, well both, girls need to be aware that they don't have to look like that, that it's not required, it's not necessary to attract a boyfriend, it's not necessary to have a good relationship with a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, whatever they're looking for. And boys need to know, and the same with porn, because sadly, I know that porn is a uh, porn is widely viewed by teenagers. Apparently, the average age for the first viewing of porn is eleven, which shocked me. But that's another reason why it's important to talk about this before the age of eleven. Um, boys need to to know that that the girls shouldn't be putting on bikinis at the age of 12 and posing provocatively for them to find them interesting as people. That, that is not their value and boys need to know that porn is not real sex. It's really tough for parents who don't feel comfortable with those conversations. Um, and of course, when I've had those conversations with my kids, I get the eye, roll, eye rolls and the oh mum and the shut up and we know all this. And actually they do generally because schools are pretty good now. But I do think, you know, my, my one bit of advice to parents who are worried about this stuff is your kids know more than you think they know. So it it's wise to get involved early and, and talk to them about it. And, and social media, that's where the cause for concern is with social media, is to make sure your children grow up with a really healthy body image um, and know that the behavior they see online is not the behavior that's expected of them it's it doesn't again it doesn't define them no no absolutely it's good advice so i mean often teenage of the, the experience of parenting teenagers and for the experience of teenagers themselves is often portrayed in a sort of negative way but what are you finding in terms of you know the positives you know as a parent you know because there's so many good things about being a teenager and so many good things about parenting teens you know so what are you what are the positive you're finding of parenting and being a parenting a teenager and being a teenager 
God, how long have you got? Um, oh my goodness. Uh, I, I do. I think it's really difficult being a teenager. I mean, there are of course the positives. You're, it's a it's a dramatic time of learning, and the exciting part of it is the bit is having independence and going off and doing things with your friends that your parents don't know about and shouldn't know about. Um, and the opportunities to to them now that are available post school is I mean, we're just doing a level now and it's just mind blowing the things that our teenagers could do with their lives so it is exciting um as parents though i I, and I'll say this openly, I was that parent who took my three-year-old to the park and tutted at the teenagers hanging out on the swings, monopolising the play equipment while there were younger children who it was really meant for. And now I, I, see, I see those teenagers who I thought of at the time as potentially a bit dangerous and sinister. And they're just really good kids who are also trying to hang out at the park because... There's nowhere else for them to hang out except their parents' back gardens, and who wants that all of the time? Um, and if you ask, if, if I'd had the, the strength to ask those teenagers to get off the swings and let my kid have a go, because all you're doing is sitting there chatting, they 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 would have, they absolutely would have. Um, teen, the, the joys of having teenagers, they are so much fun to be with. They're I mean, they're bright, they're learning stuff that we don't know about, they're passionate, they're politically aware. I was never that uh, that astute at the age of 16, 17. I had no idea about half the stuff that goes on in the world and government. We can You can have proper adult conversations with them. And yes, they are, they can be, I don't want to generalise, but they can be feisty and opinionated because they're, um, oh, what's the word, they're idealistic. You know, they believe the world can change and that they have it in their power to change it. And, and, and it's so sad that one day they will tone that down. But obviously it's necessary to function properly in the world. But if you really just listen to all of that and give them the space to get it out there, then they are, they're, they're just such good company and they're so interesting. And they give me, this particularly this generation gives me so much hope for the future of the world with the things that they, if they're facilitated, they will want to do incredible things, good, really good things. Um, they're great company when you go out with them. I, you know, I, I've, I have a summer tradition of taking my daughter out for a girl's day out and we've moved through from age five, doing every floor of Hamleys until, until it's time to go to the theatre to, doing every store on Oxford Street until it's time to go to the theatre to now having visiting a couple of shops because there are things she wants to get and having a nice afternoon tea and a good conversation. We share books. We watch similar stuff on television. I don't have to wait until they're asleep to watch things like Silent Witness. Um, it, it's amazing. It, that The transition is the hard part when the kids aren't going to bed until nine o'clock, but you still don't want them to watch Silent Witness. Um, that's that's the harder part. But once they get to 14, 15, 16, they're, they're amazing. They are not. Yeah, some teenagers, as, as we've said, have challenges and some teenagers go through a phase of not really having the best relationships with their parents. And all I can say to that is. One of them, we've had one of those phases and it didn't last very long, lasted less than I thought. And my the, the way I got through that, and I'd advise everybody to get through that if they can, is just to suck it up. Just smile and nod, say sorry when you're not sorry sometimes, um, because a lot of it is just a hiatus of emotion that needs a, a, a bubble bursting. And I, I remember giving my daughter a, a hug and saying, I'm really sorry, because she was telling me how I'd made her feel. And I was completely in the right for the things that I'd said to her and what I'd asked of her. But I said, sorry. And I felt her, as I hugged her, I felt her just deflate and relax. <clears throat> And she went off with a with a chip on her shoulder about it, and then she came back and everything was fine. Um, I I just think pick your battles. It's the age old thing that our mums and grandparents told us at the time: pick your battles. Yeah, yeah, 
absolutely and stay connected with them like you know so that when they will keep talking to you yeah absolutely so something we've discussed before on the many times actually on the podcast so is it's, it's this sort of challenge that happens for many midlife many midlife mums is that as your as your younger child starts to transition and move into the teenage years and perhaps into the middle of the teenage years there are big changes happening to you as well as you know as as a mum and you know the challenge of entering into the perimenopause and and the penable and the menopause which in itself can actually be difficult enough in its in it in its own right but then also current coincides with these big brain changes and hormonal changes that are that are happening in your in your, in your child as well so so is this something that you're that you're hearing from your from your readers and listeners and your and your you know on your podcast and on the and on the on 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 the blog yeah i'm just starting to write a little bit on the blog about in, about um menopause i I I haven't had a very easy menopause at all. Um and but I talk more about it on Instagram because I find that a lot of the people who follow me there are starting to deal with perimenopausal symptoms. And it is thankfully becoming more or less of a taboo subject with the program that Davina McCall did on menopause and there's lots of menopause experts talking now on social media. There's some brilliant accounts to follow on on Instagram if that's you. Um, but I always get a, a lot of engagement when I talk about menopause. And I, I think, you know, like anything, if it's your problem and not someone else's problem, talking openly and honestly about it is the right way to, to be because you will find that there are hundreds of other people will, as we said earlier, raise their hand and say, gosh, me too. And even I didn't know about that. I didn't know that was potentially my menopause kicking in. I will go and ask for help. So I think it's something like 34 different symptoms of menopause and most people only know about hot flushes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I'm open and honest about it at home as well. And I will, I do think sorry is a really important word for parents to use with their kids. Um, my mum never once ever in my life has said sorry to me and I think it's one of the reasons that we from about the age of 14 I remember not having a particularly good relationship with her that everything she did was right and, and parents do have a tendency to come across to their kids as everything that they think everything they do is right admitting to my kids that maybe I was a bit snappy I was actually last night about something with my son because I've, I've I've actually got a stinking cold. I don't know if you can hear it in my voice. I've got a horrible cold. Um, I had, as usual, seven things that needed doing in that precise moment. And he asked me a question and I, I, I was a little bit snappy with him. And he, bless him, found the strength to say to me, and I hope that's because he knows he can, um, you're making me feel really bad now, mum. And I, I, I took a deep breath. I said, look, we could talk about it later when I'm a bit calmer, but right right now I just need you to know I'm not feeling great and I've probably snapped at you and I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. Um, and, I, and when it's, you know, when it's, I get a lot of pain, joint pain and neck pain from menopause. I don't sleep very well sometimes. And when it's that, I will say, look, I just had a rotten night's sleep. Um, I don't, they don't want to talk to me about the menopause, but I will say when the time is right, I don't sleep very well sometimes because menopause keeps me awake and my menopause causes me to have a lot of aches and pains. Sometimes I feel exhausted by that, you know, just I'm sorry if I'm a bit snappy with you, but just maybe cut me a bit of slack today. Yeah, no, absolutely. And how's your experience with the doctor though? Because there's a lot of, there's still a lot of, I'm sadly kind of misunderstanding of, of certainly HRT because of a big study that was done that was actually turned out to be completely wrong in terms of its relationship with breast cancer you know so how is because lots of you know, lots of the mums and or midlife women generally but mums as well that we that we work with struggle with get, even convincing their doctors to get the right type of treatment for their for their particular symptoms yeah well you you don't really want to know my full story because I've, I've literally just sent before we spoke an email to my gp surgery complaining about exactly this um <clears throat> but i some doctors are brilliant i get it and will take the time to listen but i think they're down to about seven minutes per patient at the moment and that is not 
by any stretch long enough to discuss, a bit like diabetes, to discuss the complexities of menopause. Um, so I had, I went with um, sleep and joint pain problems and was offered a patch which caused all sorts of stomach problems. So I stopped and that was the end of that. Um, so I'm in a fortunate enough position that I've been able to pay privately for three sessions with the Newson Health Clinic. Louise Newson is a specialist menopause doctor. I interviewed her on the podcast a few weeks ago. Oh, right. She's brilliant, but she's got a team of specialist menopause GPs and I see one of them. And over the course of three sessions, we've been able to put together, we might need another session, a, a package of treatments that are working for me for now. Um, and then I, I'm, th th this, this is, this is what I'm trying to do at the moment, take that, that treatment back to my NHS GP and, and request that going forward. Um, and if, I'd say if you could afford to do it, do it because it is life changing. If you can't afford to do it, I, my heart goes out to people because it's so debilitating. In which case I would say use all those online free resources. So I did um, an IGTV live on Instagram recently with a menopause doctor specialist who was brilliant. She was completely frank. We talked about all of the symptoms, all of the worst ones that people don't even want to talk about. Um, and she gave a huge raft of suggestions of things that women can try and medications that women can take to their GP and ask to try, can research and go and ask for. So I think it's finding those accounts. Um, it's on my IGTV live at the moment and go find her and go and follow her and all the people she recommends and arm yourself with the knowledge. What she told me is that GPs get an optional, during their medical training, get an optional, I think she even said it was like 10 minutes. It's an optional, very short course that they can do on menopause as part of gynae studies. They essentially, they essentially don't get any training. They don't get any core training in that, which is crazy. 50% of the population going through that. It's just nuts that they, and they don't. Hopefully that will change in the future, but currently a lot of them aren't unfortunately that well informed but as you say go armed you know because people like dr louise newson and others their websites and resources you can go you know they're the places to go and go armed you know to your doctor with the information to try and persuade them to get the right type of treatment yeah, yeah absolutely well thank you so much for talking to us today so it's been lovely to talk to you but given your you know your wealth of knowledge and experience and you know, working with, with, with parents and mums of teens every day, what's the most important piece of advice you think you would give to a midlife mum who, with a child who's just about to enter into the, into the teenage years and often the kind of trepidation that comes with that? Yeah, um, well, first of all, don't be scared. It's not as scary as you imagine it to be. Don't believe the hype. Um, some people will get unlucky, but most of us get through it relatively unscathed and it's way more fun than you imagine it to be um but the piece of advice is the piece of advice that your health visitor gave you when your baby was six weeks old and you were tearing your hair out everything is a phase don't believe that just because your child starts doing or saying or behaving in some way that you don't like that that is their personality for life because it all wears off and something new comes along. And I do actually, I now believe that, that that is all of us throughout the whole of our lives. And if we all just take that in mind, that everything we're dealing with at the moment is temporary, it's much easier to get through. <laughs> Great, it's fantastic advice. Well, so Helen, thanks so much for talking to us today. It's been lovely to talk to you. Well, oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Thanks so much to Helen for some really important insights about parenting teenagers during midlife. I hope today's episode was helpful. It's been a pleasure spending time with you and I will look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs> <laughs>